So glad that you're back with us. We had an excellent start to the 2021 Truth Lectures last night uh, with a, a great crowd, and there are certainly a, a great number of you that have come in this morning. We're thankful for that. Bright and early with not a lot of sleep last night. I want to mention a couple of things just uh, as public service announcements to you. Uh, one is that there are going to be a couple of different places to be besides this auditorium today, Wednesday, and Thursday, so keep that in mind. Ladies, you'll have a lecture at 11 a.m. in the gymnasium. If you exit uh, to the, this exit on the front right of the auditorium uh, and continue right there to your left, the gymnasium is on the right. You'll be able to see it right away. If you exit through the back and follow the, uh, the hallway that has a slant, just like the auditorium, it takes you right down to the gymnasium as well. So that's at 11 a.m. this morning. Uh, for the ladies and for children, there will be a class in the media room, the library, uh, which is just through the main school hallway, and our staff can help get you there as well. I encourage you to get a schedule if you haven't gotten one. Uh, that will tell you what all is going on, the different topics and so forth. And I also want to make a mention while we're getting started this morning that over at the bookstore this week, uh, today from 12 to 2, there will be a food truck uh, out front. Uh, I say a food trunk, it's, it's more of snacks, if you will, beignets and coffee. I don't know much about beignets, I like coffee. Um, but if, if that's something you want to uh, patronize, then that'll be available for you over at the bookstore today. And then Thursday, uh, Rita's Italian Ice and Frozen Custard will be there from 11.30 to 2.30. So uh, a couple of opportunities to get some local snacks uh, while you're here in town. All right, we're going to get started. I'm kind of waiting on my technical guys to give me a thumbs up. We're good on the live stream. I also want to mention to those who are joining us uh, via the live stream, we're thankful for that. Had quite a number of watchers last night, and sure we'll continue that through the week. I uh, ask you to bear with us if there are any technical issues. We're not highly professional people doing this, but we're making our best effort to bring it to you live uh, online too. For all that are here, both in the auditorium and that may be watching with us uh, via uh, the internet. And I have the privilege this morning of introducing Brother Joe Price. He and I have shared a long relationship down through the years. I preached in his hometown. Uh, he and I were in school together, and then we've labored together in gospel meetings and foreign work. And uh, he's preached the gospel faithfully and fervently throughout the course of his life, and his writings uh, that he's often contributed to the magazine, Truth Magazine, have been helpful, concise, and biblically sound. And I just love and appreciate Joe and Debbie. Uh, they're dear friends, and we're thankful to have him speak to us on the subject of has the kingdom been established. Sometimes people look at the subject of eschatology or the study of last things, and they sort of shrug and say, well, what difference does it make? You know, why, why, why argue over things that are not relevant? Well, here is a specific area in which the implications of era can cut to the very heart of what Christianity is all about. And if we say the kingdom that Christ came to establish and that he promised to establish in the days of those disciples alive when he ministered, if that's not yet been established, something's amiss with the promises of the Lord or the plan that he implemented. And yet we know that that's not true. So it's a lot of weighty issues hanging in the balance. But before we get started, we're going to ask Brother Paul Douthit to come and to lead us in prayer, and then we'll turn the podium over to Joe. Would you bow with me as we pray together? Our Father and our God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of another morning, for this venue where we can come together and open your word and understand the uh, things that you have revealed to us through your holy apostles and by the hand of the Holy Spirit. Father, we know the secret things belong to you, but we're so grateful that you have seen fit to reveal so much to us, things about your nature, things about your plan, things that tell us who you are, how we came to be, 
and what the future will be. Father, we pray that we might recognize that all of this comes from your creative power and was brought about through your son, Jesus, who is our king. Father, we pray that we might have open minds as we look into these things, help us to understand and help us to apply in our lives. Father, we thank you especially for your son who embodied truth and grace. Help us to mirror his life in our lives. Help us to glorify you as we follow his word. Father, we pray for the speakers that you would bless them and we thank you for all the hard work that's been done to bring about this. And as we listen to the word that's being proclaimed, help us to examine closely that we might have a better understanding of the things which will happen in the future. Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for the world around us. Help us to not be uh, content to have our own salvation, but help us to recognize that we live among a lost and dying world. Help us to proclaim the gospel to those that we come in contact with each, each day so that they too might come to know the blessings of being in Christ. Father, we pray that you would continue to bless us and help us to always understand the great cost that's been paid on our behalf to bring us to your son and to you. We pray this in his name. Amen. Appreciate very much that uh, you are here and uh, very thankful for this opportunity to lead us in a study of God's word this morning concerning the kingdom. Before we enter that study, I want to ex personally express my thanks and appreciation for the invitation to be a part of this lecture series and uh, also my personal gratitude for all the work that uh, the board and the staff and everyone has done behind the scenes to make this possible. It's no small task and I appreciate everybody's work that's uh, brought this together and provided these opportunities for us to study God's word and be, be edified through that and by that to then be equipped to still teach others God's Word. And I thank you very much now that we have an opportunity to talk this morning, study from God's Word together about the kingdom. Uh, and I, there is much to be said, and I appreciate Mark's introduction because uh, what uh, we discussed this morning concerning the kingdom is foundational uh, to uh, our understanding of many of the other specifics that will be discussed concerning eschatology, and so I suppose that's why you put me at 8 a.m. Um, I, I told the brethren back home, uh, uh, speaking at 8, which is 6 back home, and I said, well, you know, I appreciate Lance. I like coffee, Brother Lance, like you do, but uh, uh, we don't have coffee here, but I told the brethren I'm going to do my best to give them a full cup of joe, so, so we'll, uh, maybe you can, that'll sustain you through the hour before we go on further. <laughs> Jesus in teaching the uh, disciples, said, when you pray, pray, your kingdom come. And so the question fundamentally before us is, did it come? Or are we still to be praying, thy kingdom come? God's prophets foretold of an insurmountable kingdom, one that has been, had been anticipated for centuries, recorded in the Old Testament for our understanding and recognition that God had made promises, God had purposes, and central in much of that was a king and a kingdom that God had anointed, that God would set in place uh, to rule over the nations and to rule uh, his people. The approach of the kingdom was perhaps unexpectedly announced in an obscure Galilean village by an angel, by Gabriel, to a woman there in Nazareth. Luke, the first chapter, records this for us. If you'll consider that passage with me in Luke 1, 32 and 35, very uh, inconspicuously, not in Jerusalem where one might think a king would be announced and proclaimed, and yet the angel there in uh, Nazareth to Mary 
says, He will be great. Fact verse 31, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his, of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who, who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And so not only a descendant of David, but the very Son of God. And so, a king that had been uh, talked of, planned of, a kingdom that would uh, fill the earth. Now the angel is saying, Mary, you're going to give birth to this king. An angel spoke to Joseph in Matthew, the first chapter, telling him to take Mary. Do not be afraid to take her unto you, because uh, that uh, child would be a savior. Isaiah 7 and verse 14 is quoted, The virgin will be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, that is translated God with us. So, a king, the son of David, the son of God, a king who would be a savior, a redeemer, who would deliver mankind from their sins. And so when Jesus came and Jesus began his work on the earth, he preached a kingdom. In Matthew 4 and verse 23, he preached the gospel of the kingdom throughout Galilee. In Luke, the 12th chapter, in verse 32, Jesus said, It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So in announcing this uh, rule and reign and realm of God's anointed. It was at the very heart and soul of God's plan and purposes, God's pleasure uh, to deliver this kingdom uh, to men and women on the earth. In Luke the 16th chapter and verse 16, Jesus said that from John, uh, he said that souls were pressing toward the kingdom. Luke 16 and that 16th verse, I believe, the verse says, the law and the prophets were until John, and since that time the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it, or uh, ace untoward, uh, toward it. People were pressing toward the kingdom. Again, in Mark 9 and verse 1, Jesus spoke prophetically of the powerful coming of the kingdom in the life of those who were hearing him speak that day. Without a doubt, the preaching of Jesus is a preaching about a king and a kingdom. Wonderful news. God's purposes at work to accomplish those things that he had spoken of down through the ages. Now, either that kingdom came, as Jesus said in Mark 9 and verse 1, with power, or Jesus is a false prophet, not the prophet, that Peter said he was in fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18 in Acts 3, 22 through 26. The Apostle Peter said that Moses spoke of that prophet who was to come to whom we are to hear and take, give heed to all that he says. And he made the application to Jesus. That's not so if the kingdom did not come as Jesus said it would in the life of those hearing him and, and indeed come with power. So we have a choice. We have a decision about Jesus when we talk about the kingdom. This is a very practical and faith-securing uh, uh, issue at the very heart and soul of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we want to emphasize and recognize as we ponder the kingdom this morning. And has that kingdom been established? You know, during the teaching of Jesus, as he spoke to people about the kingdom of God, Luke 9 and verse 11 says he did... Uh, there in the, the regions of Galilee, and the parallel is John, the sixth chapter, where he fed the multitude uh, with his miracles, that on that occasion in John 6 and verse 15, people misunderstood some things about the kingdom. The verse says there in John 6 and verse 15 that they were prepared to come and take him by force to make him king, and he withdrew from that, because that was not his plan, that was not God's plan and purpose. 
There were, king, there were errors about the kingdom as Jesus was preaching the kingdom. And even so to this very hour, there are errors about the kingdom. False expectations about the kingdom and futile explanations about the kingdom. And these false expectations, for example, premillennialism, leads to and is built upon false premises about the purposes of God. The false premise that God withdrew the kingdom promise and put in its place the church. Well, that's a, that's a false expectation to look forward to a time when God will then bring a kingdom down to the earth for a thousand years reigning in righteousness with Jesus as king in Jerusalem. False expectations. There's also false explanations. Realized eschatology, the AD 70 doctrine, sets before people false and futile expectations of the kingdom. Separate, as premillennialism separates the kingdom and the church, realized eschatology tells us that the kingdom wasn't fully realized until AD 70. And there's some drastic and false results of that erroneous view. Colossians, the first chapter in verse 13 says, God transfers us out of the kingdom of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his dear son. And that was before AD 70. People participated in the kingdom and we'll note that as we go through our study. And so even as in the days of Jesus, there were kingdom errors, even so to this hour. And so these studies of when will these things be throughout these studies this week, will help us to focus our attention upon the plan of God, the promises of God, the purposes of God, and the realization of those in Jesus Christ and His gospel of salvation and redemption to Jew and Gentile, to all creatures here, all men and women on the face of the earth. Our intent is to ask the question that Pilate sarcastically asked, you know, out of hand said, what is truth? When Jesus said, those who are of the truth hear my voice. Well, God's word is truth. Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. Thy word is truth. And so our question that we seek to use to answer today in Scripture is, what does the Scripture say about the kingdom? What does it say? There's some questions we need to ask and seek Bible answers to. Was the kingdom established in the first century? If so, when? And if not... Why not? What is the kingdom? What, what, is, what, what does that mean when we talk about the kingdom? And was, in fact, it, post, was it postponed as, as, in fact, the premillennialist says? Did God substitute the church in place of the kingdom that he had in prophecy promised? Is Jesus really king today or is he a promissory king? Is he king in right, but not actually in fact or act, as some might say? And so we ask, well, is he an absent king, or, does he, or is he a king that has an absent kingdom? If Jesus is king today, then he has a kingdom. If he doesn't have a kingdom today, then how is he king? These are some of the questions that the Bible answers. And as time allows us, we want to touch on some of these as we go through our study. Let's let's begin then with defining some terms, simply from Scripture, about what the kingdom is. A kingdom is a a dominion. A kingdom necessarily has a ruler, has a king. It It is a realm, a domain that has citizens, has subjects. And so when we speak of the kingdom of God, we're speaking of uh, that which God originates, that which God rules, His Son, the Son of God as the King, as the ruler. And as we'll note, Christians being the citizens of that kingdom. And we're going to see the definition of what that kingdom is. Kingdom is not some nebulous thing that that we just all decide for ourselves within ourselves what it is. Scripture will define that for us very very clearly uh, as we go through our study. Old Testament prophets 
For instance, Isaiah, the ninth chapter, spoke about a king. They spoke about a king who would be a deliverer, who would be a savior, who would have perpetual dominion, who would have the government upon his shoulder. Isaiah 9 and 6 says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now watch the increase of his government and peace. There will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now remember, Gabriel in Luke, the first chapter, said that the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. Now, Isaiah had spoken of that when he said that he would be upon the throne of David. He would have the government, there, and on that throne, he would be over his kingdom. So, the Old Testament prophets draw attention to a king who would be a deliverer, who would have dominion, who would exercise rule, who would have unmatched power. And note, please, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, my simple question to those of the premillennial persuasion is, when did God give up His zeal? If the zeal of the Lord would perform this putting the Son upon the throne of David and over His kingdom, when did God decide not to act zealously concerning the kingdom? God's zeal would perform it. And God's zeal has not been diminished. The doctrines of men do not diminish it, nor will we. A king who would be the son, a prince, over the kingdom. In the New Testament, that application is made to Jesus, of course. In Hebrews, the first chapter, verses 8 and 9, the Hebrew writer Uh, very clearly speaks of this king the prophets talked about, a king who would rule in righteousness. The Lord our righteousness, Jeremiah 23 and verse 6 says, and and, in Hebrews 1, 8 and 9, quoting from Psalm 45, says, But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You've loved righteousness, hated lawlessness, therefore God your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And so the Christ, the Son, the very Son of God, the application is made, is on the throne, ruling in righteousness. Again, we submit to you, Scripture teaches us that's being, that has been accomplished, and He is ruling today on His throne in righteousness, even as was predicted and promised, prophesied by God's prophets. Now, Hebrews 12 and verse 28 speaks of it. Therefore, we, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, we're receiving a kingdom. God's anointed king is reigning. He is ruling. Inspired scripture identifies this king as Jesus. It identifies his kingdom as his church. And it identifies the citizens of his kingdom as Christians. The king has, uh oh, let's come back. The king has been identified. Let's back up here. They said that this was um, sensitive. Looks like we've got something hanging us up. Let's back up a little bit. There you go. Here we are. Jesus, in John, the 18th chapter 37, Paul would later say, Christ confessed a good confession before Pilate. Pilate said, are you a king then? Jesus said, you say the truth that I am a king. For this reason I was born, or this reason I came into the world, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus said, I am a king. He spoke of his kingdom. We'll see that he speaks, when he speaks of his kingdom, he speaks of his church. We see that the Christians are the ones who serve Him willingly in the day of His power. Psalm 110, verse 3. He rules in the midst of His enemies. Christ is in authority now over all the world. All authority has been given to me. 
We don't only come, we don't only become answerable to his authority when we become Christians. Christ rules in the midst of his enemies, but we as Christians, citizens of heaven, give ourselves willingly to his service. We receive the redemption through his blood. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. More on that as we go through. Very briefly, let's spend just a short time here discussing some of the kingdom prophecies. The fact that the kingdom prophecies have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The church of Christ is the kingdom of prophecy. Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 17, I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets, I came to fulfill them. And so in Luke 24 and 44, after his resurrection, he spoke to his apostles and said that all the things written in the law and, uh, and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me must uh, have fulfillment. He's fulfilling them and fulfilled them. And so in those fulfillments, we have the assurance that the kingdom has been established. Second Samuel, the seventh chapter, verses 11 through 16, God made a promise to David. David wanted to build a temple for God, but the prophet Nathan is sent back to David, and, and God tells him that he will make you a house. That God's going to make, going to make a, a monarchy of the house of David. Your days when they're fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I'll set up your seed after you and will come, who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I'll establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And we understand Solomon was the uh, original fulfiller of that. First Chronicles 22, 9 and 10 and other such passages. And yet... That was not the end of the matter. For in the New Testament, this king that would be God's son would be Jesus. And Luke 1, 32 and 33, Gabriel telling Mary that this son of David would set upon David's throne. Hebrews, the first chapter, quotes this, prof this promise to David. That God made has set one upon his throne, and he applies it to Jesus. Hebrews 1 and verse 5 says, To which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. There's the quotation from the promise, 2 Samuel 7 and verse 14. It's to Jesus who sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 3. That now is fulfillment of the promise God made to David. A king over God's house. Now, if God made the promise, which he did, to David, he's going to set his seat upon the throne. He's going to build a house for my name. And the application is made to Jesus in the New Testament. The conclusion is obvious. Jesus established the kingdom. In fulfillment of promises that God made. Acts the second chapter goes into some detail on that day of Pentecost. Preaching there as the apostles did to those Jews gathered. Peter's sermon there in verses 30 through 36. Peter made the, the application that David was a prophet. And, and he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body according to the flesh he'd raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseeing this spoke for the resurrection of the Christ. And so it's in the resurrection of Jesus and the exaltation of Jesus at God's right hand that we have fulfillment of the promise God made to David to set one of uh, the seed, his seed upon his throne to rule the people of God and rule in righteousness. The Christ, Jesus, the son of David, is now king over God's house. Psalm, the second chapter, is a psalm that speaks of God's anointed being installed as king. God, established, God anoints and installs Messiah. It speaks of man's rebellion in the first three verses against the Lord and against his anointed. And, and God's reply is he laughs in derision. 
that man thinks that he's going to prevent God from accomplishing his purposes. That is a direct stab into the heart of premillennialism. To think that man could keep God from accomplishing God's will, God's purpose. I have set my king, he says, yet in spite of man, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree, Messiah says, the Lord has said unto me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Today I have brought you forth, I have set you forth. Of course, Romans 1 and verse 4 says that's, he was declared to be the son of God with power and the resurrection from the dead. And so, the admonition is to be wise and to serve the Lord with fear. Kiss the Son. Acknowledge Him as the Christ. God has crowned His King. Acts, the 13th chapter, the Apostle Paul in Antioch of Pisidia said that God has fulfilled His promise unto us, their children, in that He raised up Jesus from the dead. So, Nothing clearer could be said. A, a, a psalm that is quoted or alluded to at least seven times in the New Testament. Psalm 2. In Acts the 13th chapter, Paul says, It's been fulfilled. It's fulfilled in that God raised up Jesus. And so, again, conclusively, prophetically, what God promised to do, God accomplished. When He raised up Jesus, He exalted Him at His right hand, in fulfillment of the purposes that he had for the redemption of mankind. To be brought under the, the uh, voluntary rule and reign and redemption of the Savior, the deliverer from sin, his Son, Jesus the Christ. In Isaiah, the second chapter, we have a prophecy of the mountain of the Lord's house being established on the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills. This would happen in the latter days, Isaiah says. And all nations shall flow unto it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let's go to the mountain of the, of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He'll teach us His ways, we'll walk in His paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So again, the prophecy of the kingdom being established being inhabited in the latter days. The future of Zion is set forth. Isaiah lifts his eyes from the mountain upon which the temple was built in that day. He raises his eyes, visionary, looking to the future, seeing a time when God's house would be established and fill the earth. God's dwelling would be among men and men would serve Him and come to Him in this kingdom described as one of peace, not learning war anymore. And so prophetically, prophetically we have a description of the, the, the establishment and fulfillment of the kingdom, which in the New Testament is the establishment of the church. When would it be? The last age, the last days, verse 2. Where would it be? It would go forth from Jerusalem. Acts 2. Who would it be? All nations would flow unto the house of God. And what is the house of God? But the church of the living God. The pillar and ground of the truth. How would this church be judged? And how would the nations be judged? It says he'll judge between the nations. Well, Christ has all authority. His word judges us. Sets forth truth to us. And calls us to account to live by it. What is it? Is the kingdom of peace and prosperity, verse 4. Even so, in the New Testament, Christ is our peace, peace with God. And so we're both, we are reconciled, whether Jew or Gentile, reconciled together in one body through the cross, reconciled to God in one body through the cross. What's that one body? It's the church. To say the kingdom has been established is to recognize the church has been brought into existence. This body of redeemed. The value of the church, the importance of the church, is linked inseparably to the kingdom. And we must remember and continue to set forth 
the reality of the church of Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy of the kingdom. Look at Joel, the second chapter. Very quickly, you know, in Joel 2 and Acts, the second chapter, it was fulfilled on Pentecost. Peter said, this is that that Joel spoke about. A friend of mine once said, if this is that and that's this, that's that. <laughs> he made the application. He said, here's the fulfillment. Look at the, look at the Spirit's work as He brings the, the blessings of redemption that Messiah provides to the world. In verses 17 and 18 of that chapter, in Acts 2, in, in quoting Joel 2, we have revelation. The Spirit would reveal His will. He would confirm it. Wonders would be given. And salvation, verse 21, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. My friends and brethren, it's quite simple. If there is no kingdom, there is no salvation. If there is no kingdom, there is no salvation. Where would this be? Joel 2.32. Where would these blessings uh, through the work of the Holy Spirit uh, be found? Look at that please with me. Joel 2.32. It shall come to pass, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, we, and, and the quote stops there, but it continues in Joel 2. It says, For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. We have come unto Mount Zion, Hebrews 12, 22. Not literal Zion, but the visionary one of which Isaiah spoke. The, the Mount Zion where the Christ rules over the stronghold of the people of God, with God among His people. Eliminating, overpowering, triumphing over sin through the blood of the Lamb. If the kingdom has not been established, salvation doesn't exist. We cannot call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Even today, we cannot. And yet, because of the work of the Holy Spirit and His presence and His blessings, that testifies the kingdom has been established. Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Luke 11 and verse 20. Daniel spoke of the establishment of the kingdom in the days of the, of the fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire. Luke identifies the time during the days of Tiberius Caesar when John began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, as we've already mentioned, Mark 9, 1, said that before some of you die, you will see the kingdom. You'll see the presence of the kingdom with power. It will be set forth. It will be established. And so in Acts 2, the king is reigning, resurrected and crowned at the right hand of God, exalted in fulfillment of the vision that Daniel had in the seventh chapter of Daniel, when he came before the Ancient of Days, and there was given to him a kingdom. More on that in just a moment. The king reigns, the king rules. We must hasten on speak for just a moment about what Jesus said concerning the kingdom as he announced it. We've already alluded to some of this. He announced its approach. The kingdom is at hand, he said. He was preaching the good news of a kingdom and showing the power of the kingdom in his miracles. He said the kingdom, the spirit of God, the power of God, the finger of God shows the kingdom has come. He, he explained the nature of the kingdom when he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were this world, then would my servants fight that I not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. God never intended his kingdom to be like the, uh, the kingdoms of the world. It's a spiritual kingdom with the King Jesus reigning the right hand of God. And his gospel penetrating the hearts of men and women. Convicting and converting and saving so that in Luke, the 17th chapter, Jesus said that uh, uh, when he was asked concerning the kingdom of God and when it would come, he answered and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, saying, see here or there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Now, that's not a self-defined kingdom, but, a, but a, a, a description of the spiritual nature and relationship of the kingdom as it is superior to the kingdoms of men, 
Daniel 2.44, as it endures eternally. Jesus said the kingdom is his church, using these expressions interchangeably. I will build my church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And again in Matthew 16 and verse 28 is that promise that uh, of the coming kingdom in the life of some of those hearing Jesus. As he would build his church, the kingdom would come. Some of you will not, will, will not taste death till you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. You will perceive, you will know the kingdom. The church that he promised he would build. And so, as we said, in fulfillment of Daniel's vision, we have Jesus, when he is resurrected from the dead, is brought to God's right hand. And, uh, and uh, in that resurrection, Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, it says, He was set far above all rule, that is, principality and power, authority and might, and dominion, and every name that is named. He is king now at God's right hand. Well, we have a few more minutes here this morning on some of this material, but I want to, to note with you, brethren, who Christians are. We need to remember who we are in our relationship as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, our relationship with the king. The kingdom is the place where salvation is found. When Paul preached the gospel, he preached the kingdom in Acts 28. If we're going to preach salvation, we're going to preach the kingdom of God. Without it, without the kingdom, there's simply no salvation. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. The Bible tells us that Christians are priests in the kingdom of God. That we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We triumph over sin and death in Christ on the earth. Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10. Brethren, we participate in kingdom worship. Jesus, when he instituted the Lord's Supper with his apostles, said, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Commentary of that is given to us in Luke 22 and verse 18. Jesus said, I won't drink it with you until I drink it with you again in, in my Father's kingdom. And Luke 22 and, and verse 18 says, likewise, he, uh, I'm sorry, verse 18, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Now, AD 70 has a real problem here. Jesus participates with, with his disciples in in the, 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 the Lord's Supper, in the kingdom. If the kingdom wasn't fully realized until A.D. 70, then you really couldn't eat the Lord's Supper before A.D. 70. But if the kingdom came in A.D. 70, then 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26 says, that's when we stop eating the Lord's Supper, because we proclaim His death until He comes. If He came in A.D. 70, that's the end of the matter. When do they eat the Lord's Supper? When did they ever eat the Lord's Supper? Big problem. The truth of the matter is, we have a communion with the body and blood of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16. In the kingdom, in the church, Christians, even today. 1 Corinthians, first, first century Corinthians, uh, I'm sorry, first century Christians were com companions in the kingdom. John was a participant, a companion in the tribulation and patience and kingdom of Jesus Christ. And even so it is today that we are, we have fellowship together in the kingdom. We have kingdom priority, brethren. As our time ends, we want to conclude with this basic point. Brethren, our priority is to be the kingdom. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. We must live every day with the priority of the kingdom of God. We must seek the rule and reign of God in our lives with His Son Jesus Christ as authority over our lives in all that we say and all that we do. And that by living faithfully to Him now in righteousness, in truth, 
we will not only have fellowship with our king now, but we will be able to enter the eternal kingdom when time is no more. And so we close with 2 Peter, the first chapter, verses, 11 and 12, uh, verses 10 and 11. 2 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11, where uh, the apostle Peter said, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you'll never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our aim, our goal is to please our Lord in all things and that we may now, in being faithful to Him, that later we'll enter the eternal kingdom that He's prepared for His people. Thank you very much for the study with you this morning. Thank you, Joe. Excellent study. I don't know about you, but I find the study of God's Word invigorating, and sometimes on an early hour like this, we come in a little bleary-eyed, or on a Wednesday night at, at home, we come in a little bit tired. But when the lessons are compelling and when the scriptures and the reasoning therein are sound and, and engage our minds, we leave energized. And I trust that you feel that way this hour because we've been challenged and the scriptures have been set forth clearly and concisely. Thank you very much, our brother. We'll be dismissed for about 10 minutes or so and then Lance will call us back to order before the top of the hour.
All right, it's about two minutes till. If I could ask everybody to start making their way back to their seats, we'll get ready to introduce our next lecture. I want to mention just a couple of things by way of reminder. At 11 a.m., we'll have a men's lecture here in this auditorium, a women's lecture in the gymnasium uh, that's right over here just south of us. So keep that in mind. Also, there'll be a children's class in the library in the main school building part. Uh, you can see our staff for any help with that. Uh, also want to make mention of something else that was brought to my attention. Several of you have been saying we need more events like this to bring brethren together. Uh, Johnny Edwards will be teaching a Bible study in London, Kentucky. Uh, <laughs> London, Kentucky, July 20th through 22nd. Uh, if you'd like more information about that, you can email him at johnnyedwards at gmail.com. I'll try to mention this again, uh, but they're going to be covering difficult scriptures and how to settle spiritual issues, and I'm sure that Johnny will do a great job with that. So if you've got interest in that, maybe reach out to him and, uh, or see me, and I can share some more information with you about it. Uh, but without further ado, we'll get to our 9 o'clock lecture. I've been asked also to mention that there is a congregation that is getting ready to start a training program. And if you know of a young man that would be interested in that, that wants to devote his life to preaching the gospel, speak to me and I'll direct you to the people that can give you information about that. It is my honor this morning to introduce Kevin Kay. Kevin and his wife Kathy are with us. Uh, Kevin has been preaching the gospel since 1980 in congregations in Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi, and he is currently in uh, Kokomo, Indiana with the Cortland Avenue congregation. As we were beginning to think about who to ask for the different uh, lectures during this series, uh, Kevin, a number of years ago, uh, put together uh, a study of hundreds of slides on the subject of the AD 70 doctrine. And in some research that I had done, I really appreciated that work that he's done. The many different things that he has done in his preaching time, uh, he for a number of years since 2000 has hosted and organized a preacher study, often in the Bowling Green area, and I've been able to participate in that with him. Got to know him first through some similar preacher studies that had been done. You'll find him to be a thorough student of Scripture, and we look forward to what he'll tell us this morning about the coming of Jesus. When the day is awaking, when sunlight through darkness and shadow is breaking, that Jesus will come in the fullness of glory to receive from the world his own. It may be at midday, it may be at twilight, it may be perchance that the blackness of midnight will burst into light in the blaze of his glory when Jesus receives his own. While hosts cry Hosanna from heaven descending, with glorified saints and angels attending, with grace on his brow like a halo of glory, will Jesus receive his own. O oh joy, O oh delight, should we go without dying, no sickness, no sadness, no dread and no crying. Caught up through the clouds with our Lord into glory when Jesus receives his own. Oh Lord Jesus, how long, how long ere we shout the glad song, Christ returneth, hallelujah. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The writer of Hebrews declares that just as Jesus appeared the first time in the incarnation to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, so he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Brothers and sisters, like the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord, the second coming of Jesus is a cardinal doctrine that is repeatedly affirmed throughout the New Testament. 
In fact, on the night of our Lord's betrayal, Jesus promised the apostles that he would return with these soul-stirring words. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And as Jesus ascended into the heavens, as the apostles watched, two angels said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Repeatedly, Throughout the New Testament, the second coming of our Lord is briefly mentioned or alluded to several times by New Testament writers. Peter talks about it and Paul talks about it briefly in various passages. The Hebrew writer mentions it and John and Jude affirm that the Lord will come again. And then, in addition to these brief references, there are extensive and detailed discussions of the second coming found in the writings of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and then in 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And Peter talks about it at length in 2 Peter chapter 3. In fact, the second coming of our Lord is a major theme in both of Paul's letters to the Thessalonian saints. In fact, as our English Bibles are divided up into chapters, there is a reference to the second coming at the end of each chapter in the book of 1 Thessalonians. And an extended discussion beginning in chapter 4 and verse 13, going through chapter 5 and verse 11, And then the coming of our Lord is discussed again at length in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It has been said that over a quarter of 1 Thessalonians and nearly half of 2 Thessalonians deal with problems and issues associated with the parousia or the coming of our Lord from heaven. Let me quickly mention that there are four key terms used by New Testament writers for the second coming. There is the the term parousia, which means coming or presence, and the word apocalypsis, which means revelation, and the epiphania, the appearing or the brightness of our Lord, and the phanero, and if I have butchered the pronunciation, um, please forgive me which means appearance. We sing that grand old hymn, There is a great day coming, a great day coming. Ladies and gentlemen, it will be a day of manifestation. That great last day when deity manifests itself in the glorious return of our Lord. And so it is described as the day of God, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord Jesus, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in other similar ways. It will be not only a day of manifestation, but also a day of visitation. And it is so described. It will be a day of judgment But it will be a day of redemption as well. And the second coming of our Lord will be such a day of significance that many times it is just described as that day or the great day or this day. The second coming of our Lord will be the ultimate day of the Lord 
But the Old Testament speaks of many different days of the Lord for many different people. And all of those days of the Lord foreshadow the ultimate day of the Lord. But the Old Testament reveals that there are basically three things associated with the day of the Lord. And Habakkuk reveals these three elements in Habakkuk chapter 3 verses 12 and 13. The day of the Lord would involve the punishment of the unfaithful in Israel. And it would involve the destruction of enemy nations. But it would also be a day of deliverance for the righteous. May I suggest to you that the ultimate day of the Lord will involve these three elements as well. As Brother Joe has already mentioned in his previous lecture, unfortunately there is a great deal of misunderstanding and false teaching in the religious world today concerning the second coming. And so what I want to do in our time together this morning is try to share with you what I believe you really need to know about the coming of the Lord in ten words. Ten words. Now that doesn't mean I'm going to say ten words and then sit down. (laughs) Oh, you laughed. I'm glad. (laughs) You were supposed to. (laughs) It means that I want to talk with you about ten key terms that I believe encapsulate New Testament teaching concerning the coming of our Lord. And if you can remember these ten key terms, I believe you'll have a good understanding of what the New Testament teaches about the coming of our Lord. And you will be able to recognize and at least to some extent refute false teaching and error. And you will be reminded and encouraged to live a godly life. The ten key terms that I want to share with you this morning all end in a similar sound. And I've selected these words intentionally so that hopefully they will help you remember them. And so as we think about the New Testament teaching concerning the coming of the Lord, the first thing that we need to understand about that is that it will be a personal coming. Now, to properly understand the second coming, we need to realize that when New Testament writers talk about a coming of the Lord, they're not always talking about the second coming. In fact, there are many comings of the Lord that are mentioned in Scripture. For example, in John chapter 14, When Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to guide the apostles into all truth, he said, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Thus the guidance of the Holy Spirit was a coming of the Lord, but it wasn't the second coming. The Apostle Paul told the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 17, speaking of Jesus, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. Well, Jesus didn't do very much preaching to Gentiles during his public ministry. He preached to the Gentiles as the apostles took the gospel to them after he ascended into heaven. 
And so once again, the coming that Paul mentions in Ephesians chapter 2 is a coming of the Lord, but it is not the second coming. And so we must not automatically assume every time a passage refers to the coming of the Lord that that's necessarily talking about the second coming. That's a mistake that realized eschatologists make in addition to the fact that they place the coming of the Lord in AD 70. But ladies and gentlemen, the second coming will not be a figurative or a representative or an impersonal coming of the Lord. It will be literal and it will be personal. Jesus promised on more than one occasion that he would return personally. He said in Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will re reward each according to his works. We've already noted that Jesus promised the apostles in John 14, 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The angels told the apostles as they watched Jesus ascend into heaven, this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner. The apostle Peter told a Jewish assembly after he and John had healed the lame man, he told them to repent and be converted so that their sins might be blotted out so that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before. Paul told the Philippian saints in Philippians 3, beginning in verse 20, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. And Paul told the Colossians, when Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And he told the Thessalonian saints, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The Hebrew writer says, he will appear a second time apart from sin. And so to summarize what these passages and perhaps a few others that we haven't looked at tell us about the returning Jesus, it will be the Jesus who came in the incarnation. It will be the Jesus who gave himself for our sins. It will be the Jesus who was raised from the dead, who was preached to the Jews, who ascended to the Father, who was received by heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, the coming of the Lord will be personal. And it will be visible. You may or may not know that the Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus came invisibly in 1914, but that is not the coming of the Lord that is described by New Testament writers. Look once again at Acts chapter 1 and look at all these optical terms that Luke uses. He tells us that the apostles watched as Jesus was taken up out of their sight. And while they were looking steadfastly, that's when the angel said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Paul said, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. 
And John writes in 1 John 3 verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The coming of our Lord will be visible. And it will be audible. Paul told the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16, But the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Ladies and gentlemen, when our Lord returns, there will be no uncertainty about what is happening. With the reverberation of this shout, with the archangel's voice and the trumpet of God, all the world will know that the end has come. And the coming of our Lord is unpredictable. I'm sure you know that a great many speculations have been made down throughout the centuries concerning the time of our Lord's return. The new Schaff Herzog Encyclopedia makes the observation from Hippolytus to the present day there has been a continuous succession of these calculations, arbitrary enough in both their point of departure and their method of reckoning. The early fathers most commonly looked for the second advent at the end of 6,000 years of the world's history and many definite dates have been confidently announced. And yet, despite this plethora of speculation, the New Testament does not reveal the timing of our Lord's return. In fact, it teaches that that time is unknown and unknowable and therefore unpredictable. Near the end of Jesus' Olivet Discourse, he said, after telling the parable of the ten virgins, Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And in Mark's account of the Olivet Discourse, Jesus says, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. Jesus is going to return like a thief. In the night. Have you ever been burglarized? Ever had anybody break into your house? I have. And you know something? They didn't send me an, an announcement ahead of time, they didn't tell me they were coming. And they came when I least expected it. The Testament says Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. He's going to come when he is not expected. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 40, Jesus says, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. His coming will be like the coming of the flood in the days of Noah when they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. And they did not know what was about to befall them until the flood came. In other words, in the days of Noah before the flood, it was business as usual. The coming of our Lord is something that no one knows as far as the timing is concerned. In fact, Paul says he will come when the wicked are saying peace and safety. It is a time known only by the Father. 
And yet, despite this clear New Testament teaching, men have been predicting the time of the Lord's return virtually since the time of the apostles. Many have offered various vague general predictions concerning the timing of the second coming. For example, in 1920, J.F. Rutherford wrote a little book entitled, Millions Now Living Will Never Die. I suspect some of my preaching colleagues have this book in their libraries. And a Christadelphian pamphlet reads, the second coming will probably happen in your lifetime. And in the Seventh day Adventist publication entitled Present Truth, they write Christ has made it plain that his return is to take place in the present generation. It will occur in our time. That was quoted by Brother Toll in a little tract that he wrote on the second coming. In 1942. And then, in addition to these vague general predictions, there have been all kinds of specific predictions of the second coming. William Miller said he would come in 1843 and then 1844, and Joseph Smith predicted that he would come no later than 1891, and Charles Taze Russell said 1914 and then 1918, and J.F. Rutherford said 1925, and the Jehovah's Witnesses 1975, and Edgar C. Wisenut and Hal Lindsey said 1988. You got this book in your libraries, guys? I was preaching in Bowling Green, Kentucky when this showed up in my mailbox. Well, he didn't come in 1988, and so Wisnet said, well, he's going to come in 1989. And Mr. Wisnet has long since left this life, and the Lord has not returned. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, since all of these predictions have failed, we can know that these date setters were false prophets. Moses said to the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning in verse 20, But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die and if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? And Moses answers that question with these words. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Ladies and gentlemen, while we may shake our heads at such foolish speculation, what about us? Should we really sing the hymns, Jesus is coming soon, and it won't be very long? Do you look closely at the words of those songs? Can we really supply book, chapter, and verse for what they actually say? By the way, I notice that Jesus is coming soon is not in the hymn book that Truth Publications published. But it won't be very long, is Would it be permissible for me to preach what we sing in those hymns? 
Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom. Trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise. Righteous meet in the skies. Going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Can I preach that? Can I preach what we sing? And if I were to do that, what book, chapter, and verse would I provide? Oh, I believe there is a place for poetic license in our hymns, but just how far can poetic license go? If the New Testament teaches that no one knows the day or the hour of our Lord's return, how can we say Jesus is coming soon and it won't be very long? The New Testament teaches that Christ will not return until men have been given every opportunity to repent, until the times of restoration of all things, and until the day that God has appointed. And brothers and sisters, that means it might be very long. And Jesus may not be coming soon. I really like that song, Jesus is Coming Soon. I love to sing it when I was first introduced to it many years ago. But then when I began to think about the words, I was troubled. But you know, there's a quick fix. Instead of singing, Jesus is coming soon, how about this? Jesus may come soon, morning or night or noon, many shall rem- Okay, I'll spare you. I can sing that. I can preach that. I can provide book, chapter, and verse for that. The coming of our Lord is inevitable. No matter how long the Lord delays, no matter how many end time prognostications fail, the day of the Lord will come. Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, the Lord is not slack concerning His coming, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. Sadly, I fear that the longer our Lord delays His return, the greater the temptation to doubt His coming and to neglect our proper preparation preparation don't let that happen to you Peter explains that the reason the Lord has not returned is because of God's long suffering he wants to provide man with every opportunity to be saved and then folks the coming of the Lord will be inescapable inescapable Jesus said when the son of man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him then he will sit on the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so come as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. If O.J. didn't do it, whoever did 
has escaped the judgments of them. And if O.J. did do it, he has escaped the judgments of men, at least as far as criminal prosecution is concerned. But when the Lord returns, no one will escape. And then the second coming of our Lord will be eschatological. I hope I spelled it right. <laughs> That's a word we don't use very often, but we really shouldn't be intimidated by it. It just means the study of last things. And so when I say to you that the second coming of our Lord will be eschatological, I mean that it will wind up this earthly scene. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul talks about the return of the Lord and what's going to happen at that time. And he says in verse 24, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. Well, what's the chronology of these final events? Well, I'm not sure that the chronology that I'm about to share with you is perfectly accurate. We, you might have to juggle a thing or two here and there, but the New Testament teaches that when Christ returns, as we've already noted, it'll be like a thief. He's going to come from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, with his angels. And the lawless one will be destroyed. And I know there's all kinds of discussion and debate about who that lawless one is, and some think he's already been dealt with, and I don't know. And so I'm going to leave it at that. But all the dead are going to be raised at the same hour with incorruptible bodies on the last day. And those who are alive, when the Lord returns, they will be changed. And all of the righteous will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And Jesus will be glorified in his saints. And the saints will appear with him in glory. And Jesus will sit on his throne of judgment, judging all men and judging wicked angels. And all men, you and me, everyone in this assembly, will give an account of our deeds to the Lord. And Jesus is going to judge our works and our words and our secrets by the standard of his word. And we all will confess Christ as Lord. For the unsaved, it will be too little too late. And Jesus will make a separation, acknowledging the righteous, denying the wicked, and he'll pronounce sentence, welcoming the righteous to their reward, banishing the wicked to their punishment. Death will be destroyed. The old heavens and the earth will be destroyed. And there will be new heavens and a new earth. And I know there's a lot of discussion about what that might entail. Creation will be delivered from its bondage. And Jesus will deliver up the kingdom to God. The Testament certainly teaches that Jesus will take the saved to be with God. But may I suggest to you, I don't think that's what Paul's talking about in this passage. I think he's talking about returning his sovereign power, his dominion as the Messiah back to the Father. And then he will be subject to the Father. And 
And the righteous will enjoy eternal life. And the wicked will suffer eternal punishment. The coming of our Lord will be judicious. I tell the folks back at Cortland Avenue when they see me turning pages and I'm not saying anything, that's mercy. When Jesus came to the world the first time, he did not come as a judge. He came as a savior, but when he returns, he will come as the judge of all mankind. Paul called upon those Athenian philosophers on Mars Hill to repent because God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 verse 1, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And as I've already noted, but let me repeat it quickly once again, Jesus will judge our works, our words and our works, our secrets by the standard of his word. And the second coming is potential. By that I mean our Lord could return at any moment. Jesus tells the parable of the wise and faithful servant. And he says in verse 47, Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him at an hour that he is not aware of. While our Lord may delay his return for another five years, another 500 years, another 5,000 years, or even longer, he could come in the next five minutes. He could come in the next five seconds. He could come right now. real to you is it that Jesus could return in your lifetime how often in the course of an average week do you think about the second coming when you wake up in the morning does it ever cross your mind that this could be the day when Jesus returns how often do you remember that Christ could come today? I'm trying to help all of us realize that we not only need to know that Christ will come someday and he could come any day, but we also need to live with the consciousness that Christ could come today. Well, the tenth word. I wasn't sure we were going to get here. The second coming should be motivational. After Peter responds to the scoffers who were denying the second coming of our Lord, after he declares that the day of the Lord will come in 2 Peter 3 and verse 10, after he describes what will happen on that great day, he asks the question, what manner of persons ought you to be?
and the New Testament answer. By the way, this is the sermon within the sermon. Guys, if you need a sermon for Sunday, maybe this will work. We need to be an expectant people. A hopeful people. A joyful people. A patient people. A persevering people. A fearful people. People, a prepared people, a pure people, a working people, and a faithful. what have we said about the coming of the Lord it will be personal visible audible unpredictable inevitable it will be inescapable eschatological judicial potential it should be motivational Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long, ere we shout the glad song, Christ returneth, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah. Kevin, great thoughts. Let me just mention to you that this material is in the lecture book, and he has great charts in there. Preachers, if you didn't get those notes for your Sunday sermon, you can get them in the book. Uh, we'll take about a 10-minute break. Thank you.
for your attention in for a moment. We've got about two minutes before we start our next lecture. And I want to give you a, a few more reminders by way of announcement. Remember at 11 a.m. there will be split tracks, a men's session here in the auditorium and a women's session in the gymnasium. Uh, so we invite you to take advantage of that and then also the children's class at 11 a.m. in the library. I also want to remind you uh, it's a little hard to stick on the schedule the way that it's laid out by the days and hours, but if you note at the bottom of your schedule, uh, there's an open forum discussion, question and answer session that is scheduled for Wednesday afternoon, tomorrow afternoon, beginning at 2.30. So make a note of that. If you can join us for that, we'll have a panel up here on the stage uh, to, to follow a question and answer format. And I might go out on a limb here and propose that if you would like to submit questions early, uh, write those down, hand them off to somebody on our staff, and we'll be sure that we try to include those uh, for our panel to discuss Wednesday afternoon. That's 2.30 uh, afternoon open forum session. I also wanted to mention that on the tables in the back, uh, right here in the auditorium, uh, be sure you take a, a look at each of the items on those tables. Athens Bible School has some information uh, on the efforts here as they continue to grow this new campus. Uh, so I would invite you to take a look at that. We're very thankful for them allowing us to be on their campus. And then also we have a table back here dedicated to several things from the bookstore, uh, including Truth Magazine. There are some sample copies for you to take back there. I might especially point you to the one on eschatology uh, that's back there available. Uh, we had a, a special print run made of those extra because of the demand leading up here to the lectures. So there are some of those available uh, along with an assortment of others. Um, and then one final note, you'll see something back there too I want to draw your attention to. It's called the Barnabas Box. I don't know how many of you might subscribe to some kind of a mystery box, a mystery book club, or you know something like that. Well, it's our effort to do something similar. Um, and in getting some feedback on some initial efforts to do a mystery box, what we really have found that people enjoy is having something that is meaningful maybe to them personally, to subscribe to, but also meaningful for them to pass on to someone else. So it's a great uh, subscription for you to consider maybe giving your preacher, as a fellow preacher here, I would subscribe to that thought, uh, or elders or deacons or you know a Bible class teacher, Sunday school teacher. Uh, and what we do is we, we give it a theme each time, so there'll be kind of different things throughout the year that they'll get a sample of some books and products of. Uh, so it's a pretty reasonable subscription. You might see that information in the back and check that out. I meant to mention when I was uh, thanking Brother Kay for his previous lecture that I would mentioned a preacher study that he's helped organize. He is gracious enough to put that material and audio online, and if you want some good resources, go to, to it's, it's the SITS conference, stands for Studies in the Scripture, and you can go to sitsconference.com and get much of that material. As I mentioned in the previous hour as well, uh, I've been informed about a congregation that's looking for a young man for a training program. Uh, come to me and I'll direct you to those who uh, can help you with that. Uh, I'm honored at this time to introduce our next speaker, Chris Reeves is here uh, today and his wife Sherry is with him. Chris has been preaching since 1984 for congregations in South Carolina, uh, Texas, Tennessee. He is currently with the Warfield Boulevard Church in uh, Clarksville, Tennessee. And as um, we mentioned in the previous hour, when we were trying to decide different speakers for these topics, Chris has done a good deal of study on new creation theology, the idea that uh, somehow this universe will not come to an end, but it'll just be rejuvenated. And so as we were get, beginning to think about who could speak on this particular subject, Chris clearly came to mind. Uh, I haven't known Chris all that long. His father, uh, Bill Reeves, and my uncle, Wayne Partain, were dear, dear friends. And I've come to appreciate Chris in the years that I've gotten to know him recently. He, as well, is a very thorough student of Scripture, and we look forward to his lesson this morning on whether or not God will bring the universe to an end. Well, let me mention one last thing. If, you, if you've not noticed already, we've kind of categorized these different lectures. The very earliest deals with the kingdom. Then in the second hour, it deals with Judgment Day. This particular hour deals with some tough questions. 
And this issue of whether or not God will destroy uh, the universe has become a little bit of a tough question, but I look forward to the lesson in which Chris will offer to us the Word of God on that subject. for that kind introduction. I appreciate Kyle's work along with Mark and Lance and all the others who have planned these series of lessons. I can't think of anything more important with regard to a future event than the second coming of Christ. And it always needs to be on our mind. And so I appreciate those lessons that have been planned for this week. If you'll turn in your Bibles this morning to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, in just a moment we will read a familiar verse there in verse Four. I was putting on the headset this morning, and, and I realized my concern. I'm not afraid of catching anything from COVID. I'm afraid of catching something from this headset. <laughs> Tommy and um, Joe and Kevin, I'm not sure what I'll catch from this, but we'll see what happens. I hope that they uh, listen to what their mother said when they were little. She always said, wash behind your ears. So I hope they, I hope they uh, heeded that advice. In 2014, I got a phone call from a good friend of mine, preaching friend, and we had started discussing some Bible matters over the phone, and he indicated to me that he had taken up with, uh, had changed his mind on the destination of the righteous, and he started believing that uh, the righteous will come back and live on a restored earth. And that was in 2014. It was surprising to me. It was a little disappointing. But from that point onward with this brother, we had a lot of uh, Bible studies over that particular matter. About a year later, in March of 2015, I gathered some faithful preaching brothers together. Steve Wallace is here and others. Uh, Brother Dan King and others, to write a series of articles uh, in Truth Magazine covering this particular topic that we're studying this morning. And if you would like to get a copy of that, we can help you uh, find that in the archives. But from that time, as uh, Kyle has mentioned, it has been on my mind to study these matters. Are we going to heaven or are we going to come back and live on a restored earth? And of course, this has been popular among the evangelicals for many years, particularly starting in the late 1970s. A man named Anthony Hokima wrote a book, The Bible and the Future. Some of you may have that in your library. He was actually a millennial like us with regard to the thousand-year reign of Christ, and I believe that uh, Brethren bought that book because he was a millennial, but in the last chapter of that book, he advocates coming back, living on a restored earth. And this brother that I was studying with at the time confessed to me that that was the book that he had been reading to get him to thinking about living on a restored earth. So you want that book on your horizon, The Bible and the Future by Anthony Hokuma. But evangelicals have revived that position over the past few years, and it's very popular now among them. Along about 2010, uh, brethren, starting with institutional brethren, brethren began to take up with that position as well. John Mark Hicks, who teaches at David Lipscomb, has a website, and a lot of material on his website is advocating living on a restored earth. And so he has been seminal in introducing this among our institutional brethren. About the time of 2014, I noticed that some non-institutional brethren have also taken up with the position. And so it's something that we need to study and something that we need to look at this morning. My assignment this morning, and I will be following uh, the lecture book closely in some regards if you have that and would like to open there. My assignment is to answer the question this morning, does the Bible teach an end of this universe? And the answer is yes, it does. And I'm going to take the lead of the Apostle Peter in how I address this this morning. Peter does three things to let me know and to let you know that there's going to be an end of this physical world, the earth that we know and 
the planets and the stars and the sun and everything around us, there's, it's going to come to an end. And he does that in three ways, and I'm going to follow his lead. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, he says that we have an inheritance that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. So our inheritance is going to be in heaven. It's not going to be on, our, on the earth, restored or otherwise. If you turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, a very familiar passage in verse 10. It's already been alluded to some in our lectures, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. Now, we'll look at this verse some more in a minute, but just notice that he says the heavens will pass away. And then the third thing that Peter does is found in verse 13, but according to his promise, we look for the new heavens and a new earth. The nature of the new heavens and the new earth will teach us and show us that the old heaven and earth will be done away. So we're going to take these three points this morning. We're going to notice that heaven and earth will pass away. Number two, we're going to notice that our inheritance is in heaven. That's where our reward is. That's where we're going if we will live faithfully and righteously. And number three, we're going to examine this morning the nature and the statement of Peter and John in the book of Revelation of this new heavens and new earth. Number one, does the Bible teach an end of this universe? Yes, it does, because Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all things be accomplished. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And you'll notice also in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, the verse that we just read, Peter said the same thing, the heavens shall pass away. Pass away in these two passages comes from the Greek word parekamai and has the meaning come to an end, disappear or perish. Our present physical heavens and earth will one day pass away or disappear. That's the answer to our question. Does the Bible teach an end of this universe that we know? Yes, it will pass away. It will come to an end. Now, look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 while we're here. Mark wanted me to deal with this in the lecture. This is a very common argument that is being made. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, Peter writes, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall be dissolved with fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Jehovah's Witness for many years, and now some contemporary Bible scholars and unfortunately some brethren, are now arguing that the English translation will be found, discovered, or laid bare, like in the NIV, is better than burned up. They say the ancient manuscript evidence is better for hurathesitai, which is the laid bare of NIV. Or if you use the ESV, you'll notice your version says exposed. The earth and the works therein will be exposed. They say that that word, hirathesitai, is better than katakaisitai, meaning burned up. According to them, the earth and its works will be discovered or laid bare. Again, the Jehovah's Witness have done this for many years, and we're seeing it more recently among some evangelicals and brethren. So the earth will not be burned up and annihilated. It will simply be discovered or laid bare for renovation and restoration. The earth will not be burned up or annihilate, annihilated. It will be renovated. Now, I don't have time this morning to talk about which is the better word in the ancient manuscripts, but, but I do want to make a couple of points. First of all, translators of several major committee versions retained the word katakaisitai in verse 10. That's why in many of your versions here this morning, New King James, King James, American Standard, New American Standard, it says burned up. These committee members did so because of the presence of this word in some ancient manuscripts and because the immediate context of verses 10 through 12 uses language associated with literal fire and burning. Number two, even if the manuscript evidence is better for hirathesitai, laid bare or exposed, it is not a necessary conclusion that our present earth will be found, laid bare or discovered for the purpose of renovation and restoration. 
If Peter, in fact, used hirathesitai, then his point in this context would be that the earth and works will be discovered, laid bare, exposed for God's judgment of fire. That's the context. The earth and its works will have been discovered, laid bare, and exposed to God's fiery judgment when everything melts away and is dissolved and destroyed. Thayer commented on this word. He said, quote, shall be found, namely for destruction. That is, will be unable to hide themselves from the doom decreed them by God. So even if it is the word laid bare or exposed, it would be laid bare for God's destruction. Whatever is made of the meaning of hirathesitai, it must not contradict the plain meaning of pass away in the same verse. So, Jesus and Peter, and we're going to see John later, speak of our heavens and earth passing away. Even if katakesitai, burned up, is removed from the text, the idea of burning up is still expressed in the words with fervent heat. Look at that in your Bible. Occurring twice in verse 10 and verse 12. The words with fervent heat come from the Greek kausumena, meaning be consumed by heat, burn up, destroyed by burning. And I call your attention to what Brother Bobby Graham wrote in his lecture. He said, quote, such expressions as pass away, melt, burned up, dissolved, do not describe any remodeling job I have ever seen. Page 115 on your lecture book. I could not have said it better, so I thought I'd just quote him. So number one, the Bible teaches an end of this universe because it clearly teaches that these things are going to pass away. Number two, the Bible teaches that the universe is going to be destroyed or taken out of the way. It will not be renovated or renewed because, number two, our reward is in heaven. Heaven is the place where we will spend eternity, not a restored earth. And Tommy addressed this last evening, and some have already addressed it this morning. The reward of the faithful is in heaven, not on earth, Matthew 5, 12. Their treasures are laid up in heaven, not on earth, Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Their names are written in heaven. Their resurrected body will be heavenly. Their house or resurrected body will be eternal in the heavens. Their citizenship, Tommy addressed this last night, is in heaven. Our hope is laid up in heaven. Salvation is in a heavenly kingdom. Our calling is heavenly. Our gift is heavenly. The better country is heavenly. The city will be heavenly. Our names are enrolled in heaven. Our inheritance is reserved in heaven. And none of that is coming to earth. When you examine the many heaven or heavenly passages in the New Testament, and if you'll look at Appendix 2 sometime, as you have opportunity at the end of my lecture, all of the heaven passages are listed there. And in preparation for this lesson, I went through all 300 plus of them just to see if I had missed anything. But the heaven passages tell us that that's where we are going, and it's not on a restored earth. When you look at all of that material in the New Testament, there are some observations that I'd like to share with you this morning. First of all, the eternal afterlife of the righteous will be in heaven or heavenly. Nowhere in Scripture are we told that the eternal abode of the righteous is on a restored earth. Earth, mentioned over 250 times in the New Testament, is never said to be the final resting place of the righteous. You have not heard, and you will not hear this week, that the eternal reward will be on the earth. In fact, I don't think I even heard the word earth last night in Tommy's lesson, and there's a reason for that. It's going to be gone. The many heaven or heavenly passages just examined simply do not make sense if heaven is on earth. The speakers and writers of these passages just examined have had the opportunity to mention earth as the final destination of the righteous, but they chose not to do so. Why? Because earth is not the eternal resting place of the righteous. Heavenly means belonging to heaven, coming from or living in heaven. What pertains to or is in heaven? What reputable lexicon is there that defines heavenly as earthly? 
If the Bible writers wanted to say that the eternal reward of the righteous was earthly, they could have used the Greek word epigeos, meaning on the earth or belonging to the earth. They did not use this word. Instead, they used the word heavenly. Today, many advocates of a restored earth, and now some of our brethren, use the words heaven and heavenly to describe the eternal abode of the righteous, but they really mean a restored earth. This is misleading on their part. They want you to think about the familiar setting of heaven that you have read about in your Bible and sung about many times while they talk about a restored earth. This is tantamount to what I would say is a theological sleight of hand or bait and switch. Restored earth advocates also try to explain away the many heaven or heavenly passages by saying they merely point to a heavenly origin or source for these blessings, not where these blessings will actually be experienced. So it's, it's up there now, but it's going to be experienced down here on the earth. According to them, heaven is where our blessings are being prepared, but not where they will be realized. Earth is where they will be realized. And my response to that is nice try. Because when you read these passages again, you find that heaven is a place. The words in heaven and heavenly speak to the place or location where these blessings will be enjoyed. Heavenly speaks to the idea of locale or locality. What reputable lexicon is there that defines heavenly as sourced in heaven but located on the earth? Or prepared in heaven but realized on the earth? You will not find one. The eternal blessings for the righteous are laid up, prepared, and kept in heaven, and that's where they will stay. It's not all going to come to an earth, but that's the argument that's being made. Just like there are beings in heaven, like God, there are things taking place in heaven, so there will be a heavenly kingdom, and the righteous will be there. A second observation looking at all of these heaven passages, is that it is a place, not just a subjective state of mind, that people will enjoy. Heaven is a place and a location. It is where God is. God is in heaven. Turn with me to John 14. This has been alluded to by Kevin earlier this morning. John chapter 14. Turn with me there. Very familiar passage. Let not your heart be troubled, Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I come again and will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus' words here are important to our study. Jesus said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I come again and will receive you unto myself that where I am, where I am, there you may be also. Jesus was leaving to go back to his father who was in heaven. The place he was going to prepare was in his father's house. And when he returns a second time, he will receive his disciples to himself where he is. Jesus said in John 17, 24, be with me where I am. The words where I am refer to Jesus in heaven, not on earth. The focus of Jesus' words is on heaven, not on a restored earth. Jesus is not going to be living for eternity with his disciples on earth. I believe John 14 is simple to understand. A third observation we might make about all of these words is that heaven or the dwelling place of God and earth are two separate places. Heaven will not become earth, but you'll hear these restored earthers talk about that, that heaven is going to become earth. The Bible doesn't speak that way. It should go without saying that heaven and earth are two separate places, but we need to remind ourselves of that this morning. Heaven, God's dwelling place, and earth are two separate places, and they are never joined in Scripture. And we need to understand that. 
Additionally, heaven is never said to come to earth or be joined to a renewed earth. There will not be a unification of heaven and earth, as some of these scholars are saying. There will not be a joining of heaven and earth. Heaven and earth will not be joined together according to the N.T. Wright that everybody likes and reads today. All of this scholarly mumbo-jumbo is not found in the Bible, and we need to speak where the Bible speaks. We tell others to do that. We need to practice it ourselves. Not one time in Scripture do we read about heaven coming to earth, heaven on earth, heaven turning into earth, earth turning into heaven, heaven disappearing and earth remaining. We don't find that, and yet that's what's being advocated. So-called biblical scholars today, and even now some brethren, speak of heaven coming to earth, but the Bible never speaks this way. This is pure asegesis or reading into the biblical text. The idea of heaven on earth can be found in modern movies and popular cultural songs, but this idea is not found in the Bible. And when the righteous get to heaven, we're told in Revelation 14.3 that they're going to be singing a new song, but I doubt it's Belinda Carlisle's 1987, Heaven is a Place on Earth. They're not going to be singing that. You can tell what decade I grew up in. We need to speak where the Bible speaks. Fourth, when Jesus and other individuals in Scripture spoke of heaven, they emphasized the spiritual quality of eternal life, not the physical or material life. Heaven is not a material realm on a material restored earth. Jesus said that the things like physical houses and lands are for now in this time. But in the world to come, there will be eternal life. The world to come is otherworldly, not the world we know on this earth. Also note the argument of the Hebrew writer. In preparing this material, I was impressed by going back through the book of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews focuses on Jesus ascending back into heaven to carry out his priestly ministry in the heavenly tabernacle. There is a heavenly focus in this argument in the book of Hebrews that must not go unnoticed. Before this section in Hebrews 3, 1 and 6, 4, and after this section in 11, 16 and 12, 22, the author speaks of heavenly things for faithful Christians, a heavenly calling, a gift, a country, heavenly Jerusalem. These heavenly things are in the same place where Jesus is now conducting his heavenly ministry, and that's not on the earth. These heavenly things will not be on a restored earth just as Jesus' heavenly ministry is not now, nor will it ever be on the earth. The Old Testament tabernacle did not typify a renewed and restored earth, but the heavenly ministry of Jesus. Jesus is our forerunner, leading us for the way into that which is within the veil, into heaven itself. He goes before the righteous into heaven, and they will follow him there. He's not leading the faithful to a restored earth. Many Bible students today are so focused on material things of a restored earth that I wonder if they are like Nicodemus, who had trouble believing the heavenly things that Jesus spoke of. One member of the church is even now describing his end-time view as, quote, a materialistic eschatology. That's what it leads to. There are some other observations that you can see in the text, but like as Kevin uh, said earlier, when you see me flipping pages, that's my mercy. So here's my mercy. (laughs) Let's come now to our third point. Our first point was that heaven and earth are going to pass away. That answers our question. It's going to pass away. Number two, our reward is in heaven. It's not on a restored earth. And number three... The way in which Peter and John in the New Testament use the expression, a new heavens and a new earth. The Bible teaches an end of this universe because the Bible teaches that God will create a new heavens and new earth. Peter wrote this in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13, but according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Turn with me now to Revelation chapter 21 
and verse 1. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. John also uses language that we have already looked at with regard to the statement of passing away, and John also uses this statement, new heaven and new earth. Revelation 21 and verse 1, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth are passed away, and the sea is no more. Whatever interpretation we give to the new heavens and new earth, it must adhere to the first two biblical principles that we've already looked at. The new heavens and new earth are not our present heaven and earth because these will pass away. And the new heavens and the new earth must be in heaven, not on earth. So our phrase, new heavens and new earth, must match with the biblical principles that we've already examined. I want to look at three things regarding the new heavens and the new earth. The first one is that when the new heavens and the new earth are mentioned in Peter and in, by John in Revelation, notice that in both cases there has been a statement that the old has passed away. This is very important. Just before Peter wrote about the new heavens and the new earth in 2 Peter 3.13, he talked about the passing away of the heavens and the burning up of the earth in verses 10 through 12. Like Peter, John also wrote about the passing of our universe. Look at verse 1 again, Revelation 21 verse 1. John wrote, for the first heaven and the first earth are passed away, and the sea is no more. Passed away in this verse, and also in verse 4, comes from a perkamai and has the meaning depart or disappeared. Thayer wrote concerning these words of an evanescent state of things. Evanescent means to pass out of sight, quickly fade, or disappear. The first heaven and the first earth, which we're experiencing now, will one day depart and go away. It answers our question. John also wrote, look at verse 1, the sea is no more. The sea in Revelation represents the realm of mankind now on earth and particularly Christians being persecuted. If the sea is no more, then life on earth is no more. A few verses earlier, look at chapter 20 and verse 11. John wrote, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Here, in this verse, John describes in poetic fashion the vanishing and disappearing of our present heaven and earth to make way for the new heavens and new earth. Peter described the passing away in detail, and John stated that event would take place. Now, I want you to underscore something in your Bible in Revelation 21 and verse 2. Let's read that verse, Revelation 21, verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, you look at that verse carefully. New creation eschatology advocates talk about Revelation 21, verse 2, and they say that the new Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven to earth. Read that verse again. Look at your Bible again. Does it say to earth? It doesn't say that. They always add the words to earth because this is fundamental to their position. However, according to chapter 20 and verse 11, and just the previous verse, there is no earth to come down to. Now, somebody says, well, it's just a couple of little words. This is asegesis. This is adding into the text. And you have to challenge the person when you're discussing these things with others. You have to challenge them when they assert something, when they say something. You have to ask the proof for that. Because listen, this is very important. When people control the words that are being used, they control the narrative. And when people control the narrative, they control the debate. And when people control the debate... Then they control the practice or what's being done, and when you control that, then you can control the people. That happens in politics, it happens in religion, it happens 
everywhere, and it starts with the language that people are using. And if you let somebody get by with, well, heaven's going to come to earth, and you let them get by with that, then they control the narrative and the discussion, and all of their doctrine flows from that. But you have to stop them right there and say, the text doesn't say that. It's very important. The second thing that I would say with regard to new heavens and new earth is the word new. Peter and John speak of the new heavens and the new earth, and they use new or kainos. Thayer defines this as new as respects to form, recently made, fresh, recent, unused, and you can see some of the other definitions there on page 309. The word new or kainos points to a new kind or nature or quality of abode. It will be new in kind, not just another heaven and earth like we now have. It will be altogether new and different. Heaven will be completely, a completely new reality. And we know from Scripture about the new name and the new song and the new Jerusalem and all things being made new. Peter and John use the word new, kainos, to describe the eternal dwelling of the righteous, not the word renew. There's a difference. The words renew, renewed, and renewing are always used of persons in the New Testament, never of the heavens and earth. Scripture speaks of new heavens and new earth, not renewed heavens and renewed earth. That's another example. They're using that terminology, but you have to challenge that. New and renew are two different concepts. We certainly believe and advocate a new heavens and new earth, but not a renewed heavens and renewed earth. Again, I would admonish us to speak where the Bible speaks. And then last of all, with regard to Peter and John, they use this expression, new heavens and new earth, and they use it in the way that Isaiah used it toward the end of the book of Isaiah. All three of these prophets, Isaiah, Peter, and John, used the phrase new heavens and new earth in a symbolic way as a description of a new dwelling place, a new age, a new era, a new arrangement of things for God's people. Peter and John used these words in a manner consistent with Isaiah. Isaiah was speaking symbolically of a spiritual realm of Israel's remnant on the earth, which culminated in the New Testament church. Peter and John were speaking also symbolically of a spiritual realm of the righteous in eternity in heaven. And if you look at the material on page 310 and the next page that follows up through page 312, I discuss how Isaiah is using that phrase in his prophecy, and that's good material, and I would commend you to look at that. We'll pass over that and just simply make the point that Isaiah, Peter, and John were speaking about a new dwelling place for God's people, not about a renewal, a renewal of the old dwelling place. Now, before we move on, I want to address one last matter that came to my mind in doing this study. If our eternal home is in heaven, as we've argued above, do Peter and John, do, why do they describe heaven as the new heavens and new earth? Why not just say heaven and leave it at that? And I've always wondered about that. The answer is found in what Tommy mentioned last evening. The answer is found in the fact that there are various descriptions and figures of heaven that start in the Old Testament and move their way through to the New Testament and ultimately to the end of time. And this is one of those descriptions and figures. God, through the Holy Spirit, uses language of earthly things that mankind already understands now in the present to describe heavenly realities in the future. God uses language and concepts found in the past, the Old Testament, even all the way back to the beginning of time. In Genesis 1 and verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth. From that statement onward, we understand that there's a statement there that means something, and it ends up all the way at the end of time in Revelation 21 and verse 1. What is that? 
Well, heaven is said to be new heavens and new earth to describe heaven in earthly terms as a place of complete sustenance where we can dwell. It's a dwelling place. Now it's a physical heavens and earth. In heaven, it will be another dwelling place. That's why, and earth, a new earth, that's why that part is mentioned. It's not because it's a restored heaven and earth. It's because it's another description of the dwelling place that we have with God. Heaven is said to be a new Jerusalem to describe heaven in earthly terms as a place of permanent protection. A city protects people. Heaven is said to be a tabernacle to describe heaven in earthly terms as a place of close communion and fellowship with God. Heaven is said to be a bride to describe heaven in earthly terms as a place of a loving relationship between two. Heaven is said to be a paradise or a garden to describe heaven in earthly terms as a place of living beauty. These earthly terms or figures that God uses to describe heaven do not mean that heaven will be on a restored earth. They are figures, no more. The new earth part of the new heavens and new earth does not mean that heaven will be on a restored earth. These words are simply a part of the total description of the heavenly dwelling place for the redeemed and righteous of all time. The new heavens and new earth of Peter and John are indeed the height of the eschatological, I threw that in because that's the subtitle of our series this week, meaning the height of that hope that leads to the end, the last thing, our last hope, the end of our hope is heaven. God's revelation comes full circle in the book of Revelation. The Bible begins with God created the heavens and the earth and ends with the new heavens and the new earth. The Bible begins and ends with the creation of a dwelling place, heaven and earth, for his people. First earthly, then heavenly. I want to talk just a little bit as we have time this morning about this restored earth matter because it has come in among some brethren. It is an error. It is a false teaching. You'll notice on page 315 some various um, errors regarding the afterlife that are mentioned there, and I want to jump down to the material found on page 316. New creation eschatologists from various denominational backgrounds teach a restored earth. They have taken the older premillennial doctrine of a restored earth for a thousand years and made it a restored earth for eternity, and that's what uh, Hokima and others have done. Some more contemporary and popular advocates among the scholars are N.T. Wright, J. Richard Middleton, and Douglas Moo. Other advocates like Randy Alcorn and Scott McKnight write for a popular audience. The focus of this position on the afterlife is on a restored earth, although a few of the advocates would allow a place for the righteous in two different places, some in a new heaven and others on a new earth. They twist and distort a number of Bible passages to teach that heaven will be on a restored earth. And I find it the height of irony that in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16, the very passage where Peter says some twist the scriptures, I find it interesting that the very chapter is being twisted to say that, oh no, the earth is not going to be burned up, it's going to be restored. In the very place where Peter said that folks twist the scripture. One advocate, J. Richard Middleton, is so bold as to say that he has repented of using the term heaven to describe the eternal abode of the righteous. And if you'll notice in footnote 108, he's encouraging us, it it is my hope that the readers of this book would, after thoughtful consideration, join me in this repentance. I will not do that. I will continue to use heaven to describe the eternal abode of the righteous. Some brethren now, both institutional and non-institutional, are now arguing the same position. They are saying that the righteous will come back to live eternally on a renewed, renovated, and restored earth, and they are reading from these scholars. Now, I remember when I was young, hearing men like Ron Halbrook and others preach gospel meetings, I go attend, and they would talk about drinking from denominational wells. Do you remember hearing that? Drinking from denominational wells. That's what's going on, brethren, and we need to stop it. 
And just as a suggestion, if there are any elders in the congregation or in the assembly today, so used to preaching, let me encourage you to talk with your preachers. And don't be afraid to ask them what they're reading. What are you reading? If the names N.T. Wright and Douglas Moo and Randy Alcorn and these other names pop up, you need to have that on your radar because it tends to creep into a pulpit near you. One young man that I was talking with about this matter a year ago in preparation for this lesson, I called him and talked with him about it. He had put it in the bulletin. He had been preaching it. And after several minutes of hesitation, he finally admitted, yes, I've been reading N.T. Wright, and I've been reading these other individuals that I've mentioned. They're not getting it from Scripture. They're getting it from the scholars. And Paul wrote on several occasions, what saith the Scripture? He didn't say, what saith the scholars? He said, what saith the Scripture? But today, we're enamored with what the scholars say. One other point, and then I'll move on, and that is that some brethren are referencing restoration preachers who believe that heaven would be on a restored earth. This is popular. And regarding these restoration preachers, it must be kept in mind for two things. First of all, some of them had a misguided hope that Jesus would come again in their lifetime and usher in some sort of millennial reign with the righteous on the earth, and that's why they were saying what they were saying. They had misunderstandings about the millennium, and so they said that the earth would be restored. And the second thing that I would remind us is that they're men. They made mistakes. At times, they retained or returned to the denominational theology that they once left. We based our theology today, brethren, on the Scriptures, not on restoration preachers. They had views on instrumental music, the missionary society, and even the office of a deaconess, some of them. But it wasn't based on Scripture. And so we need to follow what the Word of God says, not what the restoration preachers say. Mark wanted me to say something briefly about environmentalism, so let me do that. It is something that we face a lot today. It's a cultural phenomenon in America that began in the 1960s. By the 1990s, evangelical Christians had gotten involved with environmentalism, and today, those who advocate for a restored earth make a strong argument for global environmentalism. They read environmentalism into passages like Romans 8, 21. They believe the earth will one day be restored as a paradise for the righteous, so we must practice responsible Christian environmentalism now. And you can read some things that I say about that. I believe that we need to be good conservationists. I was raised in a home where we were not allowed to waste food. We had to turn the lights off or the TV off if we weren't using it. We had to conserve energy. My parents grew up in the Great Depression, one on a farm, one in the city. And we were taught to conserve and preserve. That is a good thing. We were not allowed to tear up our shoes or clothes. We were made to respect other people's property. We planted trees. We treated our pets with care. We gardened. because Not because we're going to come back and live on a restored earth, but because everything belongs to God and it's good. Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is Jehovah's and the fullness thereof. And we're to be good stewards of what God gives us. That's why we are like that, but not because we're going to come back and live on a restored earth. I want to pass it on to my children and my grandchildren. So, be a conservationist. Join the Sierra Club, although I've heard that they've become more political than they have been. Plant a tree. Be responsible without being radical. My son-in-law works at the Nissan plant in Smyrna for the LEAF car, which has zero emissions. Work for solar power, work for uh, wind power, and those types of things. All of that is great because God's earth belongs to Him, and we need to be good stewards of it, but not because it is going to be renewed and revamped. You may have heard various individuals in Washington, D.C. say that our earth is going to come to an end in 12 years because of global warming. I'm here to tell you that it will come to an end. 
But it will not be man's fire of global warming. It will be God's fire of cosmic conflagration. The earth and the works therein will be burned up. The ultimate end of the world will be caused by the Lord. After all, it's the Lord's day. It will not be caused by what mankind is or is not doing with regard to environmentalism. It's the Lord's prerogative and judgment, not man's, to bring our world to an end, and it's foolish to say otherwise. I want to close this morning similarly to the way that Kevin closed his lesson, and that is with a practical admonition. Our study this morning and our question this morning, does the Bible teach an end of this universe, is not merely some academic or theoretical question, it's a practical one. Our universe will one day come to an end, and that is certain. But what practical impact, Kevin said motivational, should that have on us? Well, notice, in the same place where Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, he also warned men to watch and be ready for his coming. In the same place where Paul wrote that our hope is laid up in the heavens, he also exhorted believers to seek things that are above and set your minds on things that are above. In the same place where Peter wrote that the earth and the works therein shall be burned up, he also wrote about holy living and godliness, looking for and earnestly desiring the coming of the day, giving diligence to be found in peace without spot and blameless in his sight. What's the point? The point is that our world is going to come to an end, but it's not just some academic question to answer. We need to be ready for that day to come. We need to repent and be baptized. We need to live faithfully each and every day. We need to keep our hope set on heaven. In the same place where John wrote, the heaven and the earth fled away and there was found no place for them, he also wrote about the judgment day when they were judged every man according to his works. We've got to keep that on our mind. So as we close this evening, or this morning rather, the answer to our question in this lecture should then be followed by practical obedience to God's Word. So preachers keep preaching about heaven. Bible class teachers keep teaching about heaven. Song leaders keep singing songs about heaven. Brethren, keep reading your Bible, not the scholars, but keep reading your Bible about heaven. Heaven will surely be worth it all. When we all get to heaven, in heaven they're singing. Sing to me of heaven. Heaven holds all to me. No tears in heaven. Heavenly sunlight. Heaven's jubilee. That's where our focus is. Thank you for your time and attention this morning. Appreciate so much his good lesson. Let me commend to you his manuscript in the book. He had about a 50-page uh, manuscript, and there's, that includes a couple of very extensive appendices and a very thorough bibliography. Uh, we have tried to, over the last few years to do some of these lecture books that they might be resources that last long after the time of the lectures, and I think that's what you'll find in this book as well. This is one you need to have in your library. This is one your preacher needs to have. This is one your elders need to have, and I certainly would recommend that. I would also mention that Chris has done uh, a number of other written works uh, that are published by Truth Publications. He's done some workbooks. He also wrote one of the, the works in the, the Minor Prophets Commentary, and I appreciate so much the good work that he did this morning and that he's done in general. Just one announcement that we want to make before we are dismissed. Now, we're moving into the track now that deals with personal eschatology. And as we've mentioned, there is a men's and a women's track. And if I understand it correctly, the women's will be in the gymnasium area. There'll also be a children's track at the same time. If you are watching via live stream, let me just tell you the way that you can view either of those. The women's track will only be available on the YouTube channel, that is the CEI Bookstore Truth Publications YouTube channel. If you want to watch the men's track, you can either go through the CEI Facebook page uh, or you can go through truthlectures.com. Uh, we'll have just a few minutes break and then we'll come back together.